There we go. All right. So I would like to introduce everybody to Nancy J. Legg. Uh, a little background on Nancy real quick before I ever take over. Uh, Nancy received her PhD at Penn State University. She is a professor in the Department of Communication, Media, and Persuasion at Idaho State University, where she has taught for more than 30 years. She also serves as the basic course director for COM 1101, Fundamentals of Oral Communication. She teaches rhetorical theory and criticism, popular culture, visual rhetoric, and image repair. She has twice been nominated uh, for Carnegie's Professor of the Year and was named Master Teacher at ISU in 2009. Her research interests emphasize rhetorical analysis of popular culture, crisis and image repair theory, and the rhetoric of persuasive attack. She recently co-edited a book about the revolutionary rhetoric of Hamilton and contributed two chapters to the book. Other research is published in Rhetoric, Politics, and Hamilton, an American Musical, Communication Reports, Journal of International Crisis and Risk Communication Research, and other journals and book chapters. So without any further ado, Nancy, go ahead and take over. Oh, I think you're still muted. Yep, sorry, I see that. Uh, thanks for the intro. And, um, and thanks for being here and thanks for letting me be here. Uh, I've been asked today to do a brief presentation on uh, my experience with OER. And so um, that's what I'd like to do. I've just shared my screen with you so that I hope you can see um, what I'm gonna share today. And uh, I've just got a couple of slides providing an overview of um, my experience and what I'm gonna talk about today. So my plan today then is to talk about, um, you know, what course I had, um, I developed OER for, uh, a little bit of background about the course, my experiences with gathering those resources, and then um, some evaluation about the process as well as the resources at the end. So um, let me start by talking about the course that I received um, this grant for OER for to um, develop OER resources for. And um, so I received the grant in the fall, and it's a course that I teach in the fall called Visual Rhetoric. And it's a 2000 level course that's for our department. Um, a little bit of background about it is that it's a core class for our majors so that everyone in the department, this is a stepping stone course that provides a foundation uh, for the department um, and for other courses. So it's often, not always, but often the first class that students take as a result. And we offer two sections of it, one in the fall and one in the spring. And I teach the section in the fall and another faculty member teaches the section in the spring. I inherited this course when a faculty member left. So this was the first time that I taught it was the fall of 2021. Um, and uh, we have often um, 25 to 30 students is what we typically have. When I offer the course, I only offer it in a face-to-face -face setting. My colleague offers it in um, a high, high flex setting. So uh, I started to design the course when I inherited it, which was the summer of 2021. Uh, and uh, as I said, I had never taught this course or even really a course like it, but what we do our hope is um, to teach students some basic tools and language for analyzing images, visual images. Um, we have a lot of graphic design students in the department. We have video and uh, photography. And then we have students who are in rhetoric, um, public relations and leadership and, so, uh, and, and advertising. And so we have a lot of um, variety of things, but for example, students um, should be able to critically analyze images that are in um, advertisements, and that is across all of the parts of the discipline. So I want to give them the tools to do that that are specific to visual um, language. And actually, that plays an important role. I'll explain it in a second. So working from previous materials that we had and syllabus that my colleague had used, um, uh, I I deemed over that summer that I thought that the book was too dense for introductory students, uh, 2000 level students. 
And I thought that the book was an emphasis on art criticism and used a lot of language from that field. Um, the colleague who had left had a background in art criticism um, or in art. Um, and I think that that might've been the motivating factor. I don't know, I never talked to that colleague about the course, but my point was that it, I didn't think that it was fit for what I wanted to teach in the course. So I opted out of that textbook mid-summer uh, after spending months, a couple, two months working on it. And then I said, I'm not gonna use it. And so I just put together a variety of materials for that first semester through. And then the next year is when I applied for um, and received the OER grant to sort of really dedicate more time to developing a core of materials for the course. So this is just an example. This was the book that was used. And actually my colleague who teaches the course, she's taught it for a number of years and she's very comfortable with this book and with this uh, approach to the course. But this is from the book site, uh, the book, bookstore website. I just want you to see that this is what the book was. Um, and these are the costs, that kind of thing. So from it ranged from $115 new to um, $55 of digital rent. So within that range, that price has actually come down because when I originally looked at it, the book averaged um, $80 even for a uh, rental. Uh, so as I told you, um, I used to, I used a blend of materials and I really ended up um, building on those for my fall semester. So I used some old textbooks. There really is not a, a textbook for this class that I think is suitable. Um, there's a lot of materials that are online that I started to use and gather. And then I um, talked to peers and, um, and I asked the students the first time through, so how did you feel about this? Um, not having a textbook, was it good for you? Was it a disadvantage? Should I spend time looking for a textbook or what? And, um, and I, I asked them for their feedback on it and they were good about providing me concrete feedback. Um, students, of course, all said, oh no, you shouldn't use a textbook because no students want to buy a textbook. And so they were uh, motivated largely by price to say, no, I don't wanna do it. Um, but I looked at the ways that the students performed on, especially the final exam or the final project, which is a paper and a presentation. And I thought that they did the things that I wanted them to do. They had language to analyze visual images, including visual cues and, you know, those, those specific things that I wanted them to look at. So they had, um, and they under, had a basic understanding of semiotics and they could use those tools to analyze what was going on in um, uh, in images. And so I was pretty happy with that. And because I thought that they weren't missing anything, I decided that I would in fact continue uh, developing OER resources and not look at a textbook. So um, that's what I did. And so last summer, I proceeded with gathering more and making them sort of a more concentrated uh, force so that uh, they were less reliant on my lecture notes, for example, and more reliant on um, links to different sites, different exercises, different readings that I could find online. So um, that's what I did. And I did it not only because students said, yeah, we did fine in the class, but also because, you know, we know this, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but the cost of textbooks have um, risen four times the rate of inflation. Um, and this was a study that was actually done in 2018. So I'm sure that it's been much higher now. Um, and student participation is low when you have textbooks. This study that I read, um, it was from Penn State, and it said that seven out of 10 students uh, don't even buy the textbooks. My experience is about 50% of my students don't buy textbooks when I require them when I require them and they don't. Um, and as a result, they're at a serious disadvantage. And so I was pleased in the visual rhetoric class the first time I taught it, that they actually did engage the materials and they did reach the learning outcomes. And it wasn't because they were hindered by not buying the book. So I decided if I can get the material that I need to get for the course free, then obviously it seems like a very viable option. So how did I go about doing that? Um, so I, I um, you know, a lot of the stuff that I would talk about is very course specific. So if you were gonna teach a course in visual rhetoric, we'd have a conversation and 
brainstorm some ideas. So I'm not going to be too specific here, but I do want to talk about some general, um, some general approaches. There, there are guidelines online for finding OER sources, like you want to make sure that they're accessible to, to students and that the coverage of the material is accurate. And that is the biggest problem that I had, as I'll explain in a couple of minutes, was the nature of the material and covering it, um, and if it was sufficient for the course. But you also want to make sure that it's accessible for students. So if you use YouTube videos, for example, you need to make sure that they are captioned um, you know, and there are um, all of those issues for accessibility, they're important. And you always need to watch about copyright concerns, obviously. So for my course specifically, there are a number of websites and blogs and uh, that are dedicated to visual rhetoric. In a second, I'm gonna talk about what that looks like, but um, there's lots of stuff. There's like a wiki. Uh, that's been put together on visual rhetoric. Um, the Purdue OWL has a couple of pages on visual rhetoric. Visual rhetoric is taught from a number of perspectives in a number of departments. It's taught in art departments, it's taught in English departments, and it's taught in communication departments. And so depending on the sources, they have a specific angle. Um, and, and as a result, they're not quite as relevant as I'd like them to be. The thing that I do want to highlight was that I was able to find a lot of open source sites, especially for gov with um, government documents uh, or government access to photographs. And they were high quality kind of classic photographs. And that was vital um, because obviously for um, my course, you wanna be able to have access to uh, quality and numbers of images. And so I was able to find a lot of that. And I'm not sure I would have dedicated that much time had I used a textbook. Um, and so um, I did have a number of challenges, however, when I was looking for OER content. And so the first most significant challenge that I had for this course was the grade level. A lot of um, visual rhetoric websites, blogs, things that are dedicated to teachers are for high schools, some even for middle schools. And while some of that will work, it's often it, it often won't work very well. So um, the material is elementary, I would say, and it doesn't develop theories the way that I'd like it to. So there were a few exercises and class activities that I was able to find and adapt accordingly, um, you know, to my course level. Um, so that, but that was one significant issue. The second issue that I had with finding OER sources has to do with the audience. So a lot of people who talk about visual rhetoric are graphic designers and they're looking for like explanations for why I do what I do. And so that's actually helpful for me because a lot of our majors are graphic designers, but a lot are not. Um, and it's, um, it's helpful to be able to point those majors in that area so that they have that resource. But a lot of what they discussed uh, was much more kind of practical for the workplace and not um, sufficient for a classroom discussion. Um, relatedly, some of the content was very simplistic. So here's the thing about visual rhetoric. Now, I, I'm a rhetorician by trade, and I call myself a rhetorician, and I own that proudly, um, despite the fact that Plato would hate me. Uh, but in any event, I, I'm a rhetorician. I teach issues and tools of rhetoric in many of my courses, including, of course, the foundational aspects of Aristotle's proofs is what they're called. So they're ethos, pathos, and logos. So what a lot of people do in developing visual rhetoric is they say, well, here's um, an image and here's rhetoric. And then they talk about Aristotle's ethos, pathos, and logos. So let's look at ethos in this image. And that's taking rhetorical tools and applying them to images, which is cool. And I teach that in other classes, but that's not teaching students the tools of um, visual so that the, the visual cues, so we can talk about depth and perception cues, and we can talk about um, signifiers and symbols and color cues. And none of that really is in this. So a lot of visual rhetoric is actually stuff I might use in another class, but it's not appropriate for this class. And finally, uh, some of the challenges I had were in the format. Some were blog posts, quick quizzes, um, and they just lack 
development and support. Sometimes the information isn't cited, so I don't know where it came from, so I'm not comfortable using it. And that took me a lot of time to kind of fact check and because people on people post all kinds of things online and they're not accountable or don't think that they're accountable to cite their sources. And as a result, I often um, disregarded some sources because I didn't know the credibility of it. So there were challenges. Um, and I'm still, if I'm going to be honest, looking and putting together resources for my class. Uh, and um, this is an ongoing, never changing, it's just part of the dedication of, you know, teaching this class. You have to spend five hours a week uh, putting together resources. So that's what I did. I used a blend of course materials. I was able to use those OER blogs or the samples, right, some of the exercises um, and use them, integrate them into class lectures and then use some of the probes um, online for discussions. I use the blogs and the tutorials. Uh, YouTube videos were very useful for kind of quick overviews of ideas. I found one, for example, about media literacy um, with visual issues, and they give kind of five rules for uh, knowing if um, an image is a legitimate use of an image or if it's been doctored in some way, and there are five tips, and then they explain it. So I was able to show that, and then we use those five tips, and then I had them go out and explore it with an exercise. And having that YouTube video um, accessible to them so that they could go back and view it often, I think was great. And it was good because it was so succinct. It was like five or six minutes. And that's the only attention span, right, that our students have. Um, I also used a lot of source materials from other universities. A lot of universities um, are great about posting whole uh, tutorials on a topic. And some of them had tutorials on visual rhetoric. Now, some were from an English perspective, so I adapted them, but there were some that had very specific uh, language that I wanted to teach students in terms of the tools. I also found some journal articles that I was able to incorporate um, in the class and some suitable texts that uh, I was able to adapt some of those lectures for my lecture material. I didn't link those for students because of uh, copyright issues, but that helped provide substance for the class. Um, so I also want to highlight that I did link the journal articles and some of them were really cool. Like, let's look at the, um, the, it, the persuasive impact of Facebook um, photos for political campaigns. And they compared, uh, they compared Mitt Romney and Barack Obama's Facebook pages and what they posted. And then they did uh, Trump and um, uh uh, I can't remember who to try. Oh, and Hillary. Goodness, I couldn't. How can I not remember that? But in any event, I they so they did those, and then they showed them, and then there were tools for analyzing them, and they were really interesting. And I found those images in the open source website, so I was able to show the images and talk them through the journal article. But they didn't read the journal article, and so it was me doing the lecture on the journal article with the images there, and so. There's something to be said about, you know, I don't know how to make students do the reading. Um, they can say the book was too expensive, so that's why I didn't uh, buy it and read it, but also when it's free, they don't read it. So that's very disappointing, but it's true. Uh, and so I don't know how to manage that. And honestly, it's been an existential crisis for about two years now, so I'm working through it. Um, the class ended up as a result of the fact that students simply didn't engage with the material before class, that it ended up being more lecture than I had planned. Um, but it was lecture and I had PowerPoints. And so um, and, and so the classes were relatively fun, but um, you know they could have been really fun if students had, had engaged in the material. Um, they obviously had access to the central material. And because I don't have a textbook, I'm guilt-ridden. So I post my PowerPoints. And I'm still debating about whether or not that's a good solution. Um, because what's interesting is that students in this class actually performed slightly worse than students the year before. Uh, there's a lot of factors involved with that. I used OER resources for both, but I was more lecture heavy the first time than I was this time. So I don't know really what to make of it. And I think it's too small of a sample size and too many variables to discuss you know, causality. So I'll continue with this project and continue developing these resources um, and 
hope essentially for better outcomes next year um, because I've invested a huge amount of time doing this. Um, and that's what leads me to the final thing I want to talk about, which is like future considerations for using this for, for me. Um, and as I said, uh, students still don't engage with the materials, free or not free. YouTube video that's fun, journal article that's cool about Facebook posts, um, or a blog for a quiz. Uh, it, it, there can be many dog and pony shows that you provide, but I have had difficulty with students engaging, doing the work before they come to class so that we can use it in class. And you know that's probably a personal problem that I have that I'm working through, but I don't know that, um, I don't know that free materials is helping them. Um, they want my PowerPoint slides and I, so I provided them, but my PowerPoint slides are bullets, right? And so I don't have large amounts of text or explanations supporting them. Uh, and that really um, annoyed them because they don't take notes either. And so as a result, it became, you know, give us more PowerPoints so that basically so that we can have them in case we need them. And so I would say, well, you've got the article that it's based on. And so you could read that. Um, and there was a, actually um, a, a frustrating give and take, I would say. I will also say that because of those issues and all the information was there and accessible for them um, uh, and, and other reasons, it's not causal, but my attendance this uh, past fall semester was the worst attendance I've had in my more than 30 years of teaching. Uh, and um, sometimes I would, I have a class of 30 students and I teach to 12. Um, most times I would teach to 15 or 16. And um, so that doesn't have anything to do with OER resources, but I don't know. But it, it does impact how I choose materials and choose to present it. So um, anyway, a lot of times students didn't feel like they were missing anything because I made sure that I had my materials available for them. So I'm gonna modify my attendance requirements. I'm gonna do some things with that. That's not directly related, but it certainly is uh, a significant factor because you know I'm sort of at my wits end in terms of how do I engage my students. I know that I'm not alone with this, but this is a trend that I've noticed certainly since COVID, but it has gotten significantly worse in the last two years. And you know I can have materials that I provide in class and that is free for them and that there's a variety of stuff, so it's not just me talking, and the dog and pony shows aren't working for them. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I think it's a really cool class, right? Like you look at this picture of a whale jumping over a boat, and the, let's talk about the significance of this, and let's talk about how we can evaluate it, and you know, what's the message that's here? And so it's fun stuff. Um, and so I'm, I'm hopeful that I can continue to engage my students using these kinds of resources so that they don't have to pay for it. So that's sort of my uh, final conclusion, which is if I could find a textbook that was available for this course, that taught this course as I teach it with the, the tools, the, the visual cues, you know, so that they're tools for analyzing things and the combination of semiotics, I would use the textbook in a heartbeat. And I might, that might not be the right thing I'm supposed to say here, but I would adopt it. And I would adopt it because if it were obviously reasonably priced and textbook publishers are feeling the pressure, so they're doing things. Sometimes I don't think it's enough, but um, they have student resources that are available, exercises, practice quiz banks, discussion questions, right, applications. And that's what I've been putting together. And I have to constantly update them and I have to constantly change them. And so it would be cool to have somebody else do that. Uh, and maybe they would be more interesting than I am to my students. Um, people say, well, then maybe you should write a textbook, Nancy. And it's like, yeah, maybe, but I'm really not that interested in doing that right now, but thanks. So um, there are lots of challenges with that. And then there are cost issues related to that. And so I'm not interested in doing that, but I, I would look for a book and I have found two books that have parts that I'd love to uh, talk to the publisher and just use these chapters. Um, and that might be something that I might use in the future that would be a compromise um, that, and publishers tend to be willing to do that nowadays since they're losing people um, to adopting their textbooks. 
So anyway, I'm still working on it. It's a work in progress. And that's, um, that's pretty much what I have to say. So thank you for listening to me. And I'm happy to hear your questions or if you've got some comments um, or shared experiences. I actually have one for you real quick, Nancy. Um, since you're mentioning like if you had the book available, you would adopt it, of course, if it was reasonable and all that. Um, so saying that there is no book that comes out, you don't end up writing one. The amount of time and effort that you're talking about that you put into this, did you find it worth putting in that time and effort for the class? Or is this something where like if you didn't already have it developed and you knew it would take this much work, they'd be like, no. <laughs> I, I kind of feel like I don't have a choice. Uh, and yeah. so is it worth it? It's like, well, it's just what I have to do. It's just part of my job for taking the class. I enjoy teaching the class a lot. So that makes it worth it. I think the content's important. So I think it's worth the effort. But um, I do notice that some of my other classes I don't spend as much time on because I'm spending so much time doing this. Um, and so that yeah, so I don't know. I feel I kind of feel badly about that now that I've put that on the table, frankly. Nancy, I, I this is Laura. Hi, Laura. I, I can um I empathize greatly with almost everything you say. I go, oh my gosh, that's my life. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> because um I don't use a textbook and everything I bring in is a conglomeration of, of, you know, I've linked this or I've used this or, you know, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with how do I organize this, this universe that I'm bringing together into this course. And uh, hmm. A, because I know they're not going to buy the textbook, and B, because I it, it, it I know they have six seconds. I mean, when you said six seconds, I was like, yep, she's on it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I teach in chunks, and uh, it, so I'm wondering how, uh, so I also am struggling, I'm spending at least five hours a week on my one uh, three credit course, just, you know, um, thinking through how my, you know, my, you know, I have already, you know, I have my pedagogy for the semester and my outcomes, but as far as getting it into the format and the, the timing and how my, I mean, literally, you know what I did this semester? because I'm teaching in LA 270, which is a um, computer lab. After the second week, I realized I'm just seeing their hairlines. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, because it's computer screens. And this, I, I mean, I'm teaching information literacy research instruction, so I, I expect them to be on the computer screen. But it's such a barrier yes. that I now take my laptop I sit in the rows with them and I plug in my computer and um, as if I'm a student and work now, turn around. So like I'm pivoting and I'm like reaching around to talk to them to, for the interaction component. And yeah. uh, sorry, side note. One thing I've done is I've, I've um, used the attendance I do have an attendance model, but I've modified the attendance model in addition to, I did, I'm doing a trick that one of my old English professors did in one of the classes I attended, which was a requirement. They have to give me two substantive comments and or questions a week. And then, uh, and they still don't do it. So then I have to come up with creative, uh, okay, we're going to work in a group, or if you work with me one-on-one, -on -one, then that counts as your participation this week. <laughs> so, and they don't get it if they don't come to class. So I'm wondering, have you come up with a way, so I'm assuming, how are you gathering all your materials? Are you creating a Moodle course and then 
uh, bringing it from from semester to semester and then uh, modulating it. How have you? Yeah. Yes, I do that. So I use the, you know, I back up the Moodle course and then I use it as the foundation for the next year. And then I, I so I have the re the foundation there and then I add to the, uh, to the material, including, you know, it has my PowerPoints on there as well. So it's all in one spot. Oh. So it's much, yeah, I, I don't start from scratch each time for sure. So, so your OER is in your course. Yes. And then you're you're going from from semester to semester. That's right. That's what I do. Yes. Okay. I see there's a comment and I know that Yeah. Who said that? <laughs> Ryan, you're so good. For both Laura and Nancy. We in the IT are suit would be glad to help you bounce ideas about what might help with student engagement. Yes. Um, who was it? I think it was Lisa who helped me figure out the um, attendance module, the engagement module, because I said there is something I want to be able to grade them in this way every day, and I don't want to have to keep track of it in an Excel spreadsheet. And I want to be able to see that I want them to be able to see that see it as they go along. And so it is something that I grade every week, so they see it affecting their grade so I like it um, but I have yet to attempt the, the wiki Ryan oh I can't hear you your, your mic oh ah Nancy, have you tried the wiki? You mentioned a wiki. Um, have you used a wiki before in your class? Oh, now I can't hear you. You may just need to unmute, Nancy. Sorry, yeah, I just couldn't get to my mouse there. Uh, but yeah, I have um, a little bit. Do you use the Moodle wiki or do you actually do oh, a, a an online? Yeah, there's one for visual rhetoric that's online. That okay. I, yeah. Interesting. Some of it's not doesn't work, but some of it does. Very interesting. Well, I'm fascinated by uh, your lecture. A lot of what I do is um, I come from a graphic background, so I feel like I want to pick your your brain. And and now I want to be added to your class, and I may have to take your course just <laughs> for the for the fun of it. Um, okay, it is a, it it's a cool course. I mean, there's cool stuff to learn in it. So, you know, I'd be delighted to have you just audit it, stop by or something. Yes, um, but any tricks you learn as far as student engagement let me know and I'll keep sharing my tricks, but I'm telling you, you are not alone. No, and I know I'm not. I know it's a problem and I know that it's uh, been widespread and I know that it's happened since COVID and all of those things, but you know, it's, you know, it just, uh, it, it's devastating, frankly, it's just yeah. devastating. That's what I was trying to say. Hopefully you can hear me now, but um, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So yeah, kind of like how, um, you know, when you have so much expertise and so much deep domain knowledge, as you both clearly do in what you do, um, similarly to how you might rely on librarians to help you find the newest things or things you might not have already um, crossed paths with, um, we in the ITRC would be very happy to help lighten the load of the pedagogical engagement stuff because you're already yeah. doing so much. So it's not that what you're doing isn't good. It's just if we can help that's what we're here for. So we'd love to bat some ideas around and see what you think might um, be worth trying with your students. So please don't be shy. Great. We didn't really it. like that. Yeah, I I'm appreciate that very much. Yeah, I'm going to take you up on that because I really want to try the wiki. I have an idea for it and I'm, I'm actually kind of afraid of <laughs> afraid of using it, but I, I, I want to I want to try it. Um, Honestly, Nancy, I'm down to giving Friday presents. 
I, if they show up on <laughs> Friday, they get a cool thing because <laughs> whatever it takes, I understand. Yeah. Well, do we have any other questions from her, either one of you for Nancy? All right. Well, Nancy, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the call. Thank you both, Laura and Ryan, for joining us. And uh, we thank will you. talk to you all later. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy. Bye.